Hello, 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 friends from around the world. Great to be with you. My name is Cornelius Williams, and I'm the president of the Resurgence Leadership Foundation, and I'm a co-host along with Dave Hillis, who is the president of our global network, and we are so glad you are here with us on our last uh, episode of Traditioned Innovations, and man, has it been just a sweet time each week, and if you haven't um, tuned in to the latest episodes, I would definitely encourage you to go to our website and check out um, the earlier episodes. So, hey, what I want to do, um, we got a great lineup for you. Chris Lowney, who is the author of the best-selling book, Heroic Leadership, will be with us as our thought leader, and Sam Acevedo from Boston um, will be with us too. And so, man, we it's a great lineup as we finish strong, and my friend Jean Milliken, she's going to close us out in prayer. But before we go on, I'd love to uh, pray. And so let's pray. Lord, we, I am just so grateful. And I know I'm the co-host, but in many ways during this series, I felt like a participant that's being dragged along on a sweet journey. I uh, thank you for these moments that we slow down each week to uh, engage in uh, dialogue and to hear from thought leaders and practitioners about the great work that we would continue this on through um, our network. I commit this time to you, and as I prayed, may it be evident that you are present with us today. Um, encourage those that need to be encouraged. Strengthen the hands of those that are doing good work. For your word says we are not to grow weary in doing well. So we hope that this helps that. So we commit this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Okay. Well, hey, just a couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, one, hey, I love you. I was talking to some friends last week. If you're on Facebook, hey, what's going on? What's up? What's up? If you could just hit us up in the chat. Hey, just say hello, wave. Uh, it'd be great. We uh, Just know if you're with us on Facebook Live that there are staff that are there ready to engage with you. And we definitely want this town hall uh, to be engaging. Well, for those of you that are on Zoom, you can raise your hand in the chat. You can ask questions, um, make comments. We definitely welcome uh, you to, to engage with us. As a matter of fact, last week, we started with the question that came um, that someone had dropped in the chat. So we're here curating what you're saying so that we can continue to stay engaged. And I'm just glad to be with you. I am just glad to be with you. For, um, for y'all, I, I said this uh, to Dave uh, last week, just how much I have really appreciated uh, this series, Tradition Innovations. You know, when we were thinking about it, um, I really had no idea what the Lord had in store for me. And I, as a president, shoot, as a human, I'm just uh, striving to be kinder um, and to be more effective in the work that we're doing. So uh, I'm just grateful, grateful. So Dave, thank you so much for this. And so with that being said, Dave, you know, I, I, I just want to start with this because I am a president of a local leadership foundation. And I, I'm curious, Dave, you know, we've been talking about this for the last five weeks. Hey, what is it you want us to walk away with as, you know, as presidents, as board members, as friends of this network, what would, you, um, as it relates to tradition innovation? Yeah, great, great question, Cornelius. Um, you know, one of the things about being involved in this leadership foundation work now for, um, again, I've quit counting because it uh, embarrasses me, uh, but the better part of 20 years having watched, I think, Reed uh, and so many others, when you step into the space of the spiritual and social renewal of cities, uh, if not the first thing that you feel the weight of, it would certainly be the second or the third, and that is, is do I have the resources by mm. which to get this done? Um, so you begin to, you know, scrounge around and, and look for resources uh, at, at every level. One of the resources that I am deeply convinced has been overlooked, um, and not just by Leadership Foundation presidents, but really kind of the, the church writ large, uh, is what I would describe as the kind of ancient storehouse um, of which you know, so many things could come forward if we just became conscious of it. 
So, you know, part of what we're hoping, I think, to grab a hold of here in this tradition to innovation is, yes, let's continue to be innovators. And again, we'll get a great taste of this in our conversation with Chris today. Yep. But what's really interesting about Chris um, is that uh, the innovation that he effectively argues for comes out of a deep tradition. Um, and I am, uh, uh, again, convinced and persuaded that for leadership foundations in our work in the 21st century, uh, we will be more effective to the degree that we kind of grab on, you know, to some of these old ancient traditions that are sitting there uh, kind of waiting for us. Again, the parable for me that, that best captures that uh, is at the end of Matthew 13, where Jesus says, you know, the kingdom of God is like that person who goes into their house and pulls out of it that which is both ancient and new. Uh, and for me, that's a perfect kind of uh, almost uh, parentheses around the sort of resource that is available to us if we'll spend some time thinking about it, praying about it, talking with each other about it. Hmm. Well, okay. And I think you've mentioned that before, this ancient and new, you know, and Dave, you've been around me long enough, you know, I'm kind of going, okay, I'm trying, to, I'm visual. So could you give us a couple of examples yeah. of what that storehouse that, uh, you know, I wrote that down, that storehouse that you talked about, the ancient new place you want us to access? Yeah, uh, I will. Uh, maybe make one other comment, though, Cornelius, about, I think, the person of Jesus, uh, given, mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the huge... I think realities of leadership foundations and our charism, right? Again, that was, you know, first manifested in Sam Shoemaker and Reed is what I would describe as our high Christology. Um, and that statement, I think, is significant. Um, you know, again, we could say more about that. But the notion that leadership foundations really rallies around uh, this person of Christ, both fully divine uh, and fully human. Mm. So, you know, on a very practical level, uh, we try to pay attention to the Gospels, right? What was this Jesus uh, up to? I think one of the curious things about Jesus um, is that there's a part of us that wants to believe that he came in uh, to, you know, uh, first century Palestine. Uh, and in the spirit of, of the money changers turning over the tables, just turned up everything upside down. And there's an element of that. I, I think we, we would be foolish not to pay attention to the fact that Jesus came in and brought a kind of new wineskin. He, he references that himself. <clears throat> but I think to go too far and not remember that he also, right, in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, says very strongly, you know, I've come to fulfill the law. I mean, mm. every jot and tittle of it will be fulfilled uh, in my coming. So in other words, there's a sense in which Jesus was fulfilling something that was deeply ancient um, and that he was cognizant of that uh, and was in many ways, I think, um, a person who was deeply familiar with uh, his tradition, uh, you know, the Jewish people. And it wasn't yep. to create a new religion, right? It was actually uh, to bring a kind of completion of fulfillment um, to Judaism as he understood it. Well, I think that's the spirit uh, of us. Um, I, you know, I think LF on our best days, we're not creating something new, um, yeah. right? Untethered, uh, unanchored from that which has gone before us. Um, and so that's, that's very significant. Yeah, you know, one very practical example, not to make this just a a Catholic conversation, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I've, I've tried to pay attention to church history. And uh, one of the really interesting kind of pieces of history for me is actually John Calvin uh, with regard to cities. Uh, you know, Calvin was, again, uh, a person who uh, set up shop in Geneva. Um, he was, uh, you know, pretty bent on, you know, making Geneva the city of God, the light on the hill and uh, began to put uh, some rules, <clears throat> some practices in place that was going to do that. And then lo and behold, he discovers that if an earthquake or a fire shows up, uh, he is going to grab a bucket uh, from a Muslim <laughs> or an atheist as quickly yeah. as he is a Christian, right? Yeah. We got we to save the city. 
And it was out of that particular mm. experience mm. that Calvin came up with this marvelous framework where he says that cities um, are graces, but they're filled up with two different kinds of grace. One is saving grace, right? Those are the synagogues, the churches, the temples, um, you know, that we all, you know, pay attention to with regard to our interior life. Um, but there's also common grace hmm. uh, institutions. And these quite, you know, practically here are the sewers, uh, the street systems, uh, the street lights, right, that we all participate in for the good or the, of the common good. Um, I, I think that that, just that piece of ancient history for me, Cornelius, as I've thought about leadership foundation work is absolutely key because we're a city centric movement, right? That's we, right. We absolutely care for saving grace institutions that populate cities throughout the world, but we equally care uh, for the common grace institutions, right? We are, you know, as William Temple said, you know, as concerned with, you know, sewers as we are souls. Yep. And the two are the same side uh, or two sides of the same coin. Um, and so that's, that's an example um, of, I think, a, an ancient treasure um, that we pull forth and make use of it uh, in leadership foundations today in the 21st century. Wow. And okay. So Dave, forgive me for connecting a dot here. Is that what, you know, when you say engaging leaders of good faith and goodwill, it comes from that idea right there? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, you're, uh, you are, you are uncovering me, right. With regard to none of these things are original. And uh, we're going to get, we're going to get more example of that in talking with Chris <laughs> because um, I'll say more about that in a minute, but yeah, it's, it's very much a, uh, a John Calvin reformation thought. Okay. And so, okay, Dave. Okay. So as a president, as I, I love, you know, again, Jesus comes. I love our high view, our Christology, and how we continue to come to that. You know, whether it's whatever we're wrestling with, we always come back to that Christology, the the divine, the human, and the you know, Dave. I, I said this to you, and the two S's again. What were the two S's again, Dave? The yes, subsidiarity, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I always I always get this wrong as well, but effectively. Um, it's what it means to work uh, together. So, yep. so, so idolatry, something like that. Chris, yeah. Chris will actually kind of clean that up for us. So, okay. Well, I, you know, I, I, I will say this, Dave, as, 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 as a president, and I don't know how other presidents feel or those who are on here. It's all man that extreme middle, to the high view of scripture and the high view of humanity, and sitting in that, and then hearing about this, Dave, saving grace and common grace. Um, I thank you for the challenge to move back there because, you know, it is so easy to be polarized, to go to one, man, man, I can focus on saving grace or I can be focused on common grace, but trying to sit in that tension, um, yeah, that's right. would be great. Is there anything, you know, before we get to Chris is, uh, you know, I feel like this is the last thing said in the huddle. So, you know, so if you're out there with me, I play basketball. And so I feel like Dave is the coach. And during a timeout, he kind of, hey, all right, everyone focus in on the coach and kind of hear what they're going to say. And so is there, um, what would you want us um, say to us, Dave, um, as we kind of conclude this? Um, yeah, this, this uh, series. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, again, Cornelius, and I think I would just maybe go full circle and say that, you know, one of the things about leadership foundations and, again, our charism, which is that we see the city as God's playground, uh, we talk a lot about the fact that, that that impacts three things. So the first is theological, uh, right, that God is a friend of the city rather than a foe. Uh, that it impacts our sociology. Um, our neighbor is now a colleague rather than a competitor. But the third that is maybe most difficult is that it impacts our view of the economy. And hmm. the economy is now one of abundance rather than scarcity. And I think I would just say about tradition innovation, this is one of the rivers uh, that contributes 
to be able to, you know, have us have a view of this whole thing as abundance. Uh, there is more than enough there. Uh, God has brought this, I think, to our feet. So like in the, you know, in the spirit of, of Peter, where he says, God's given you everything you need, right? Mm. Life of godliness. Um, so the, you know, the prayer isn't anymore, you know, God, give me this. Uh, it is mm. actually, God, help me see what you have already brought uh, to us uh, to do this job. And I think that's subtle, right? But it changes everything. Um, you know, I think you go from kind of a, a grasping sort of Christianity uh, to a receiving Christianity. Mm. Um, and, and I think that would be the thing, Cornelius, I would want uh, all Leadership Foundation presidents mm. to walk away with. Man, that was Second Peter 1. That was Second Peter 1, if y'all are, you know, oh, you for all me. of you. Okay. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, man. Thanks, Dave. I mean, I, I mean, look, My pleasure. I mean, I, man, I, I appreciate that. And um, especially as we get ready to hear from Chris, uh, which I'm looking forward to it. I know, Dave, you're going to introduce him. Uh, yeah. But, you know, as you know, it's so funny. This is this is what's great about you and I, you know, as you can say, hey, you know, my Catholic and, you know, I, I'm every bit of Protestant, Pentecostal and all those other categories. Um, one of the things that is undeniable, though, is... Um, truth yep and uh, discipline and so chris's book has really been formative for me too and oh, so good. i am so glad for him so man well with that go, i'll let you go ahead and introduce him let me introduce chris let me begin everyone by just reading um a little bit of biography on chris uh and then saying a couple comments just about his uh influence on me so chris currently is the vice chair of the board of common spirit health America's largest nonprofit health system with 29 billion in revenues and more than 150,000 employees. Uh, he is a one-time Jesuit seminarian, I think about seven years worth. I, I forget, Chris, Jeez. you can clean that up. Uh, and later served as managing director of J.P. Morgan and Company on three different continents. Uh, he's a popular keynote speaker who has lectured in more than two dozen countries on leadership, business ethics, decision making, and other topics. Uh, he is the author of six books and has co-authored two more. Uh, his best-selling book, Heroic Leadership, has been translated into 11 languages and it was named uh, to the recommended reading list of the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Um, on a very personal note, um, and I, I can't actually overstate this, um, when I uh, was taking over from Reed, uh, and, you know, was asked to, you know, help lead the leadership foundations. Um, I've got very little creativity within me. And so I look for models. Um, and I think the only way I can describe this is I happened upon Chris's book, uh, Heroic Leadership, and would say for the better part of 11 years, um, it has been my blueprint uh, to think about leadership foundations. Um, again, there is the Jesuit spirituality to be sure, and that, of course, has been important to me. But that's really separate from the, the actual contribution of the book, which is the Jesuits as an organization. So through that, um, I then uh, said, I got to get to know this guy. And there's always that perilous step, right, where you now are going to talk to a person, the author who wrote a book that you really liked, and will this man, will this author live up uh, to the book he wrote? I'm very pleased to say um, that it has been wonderful to begin to develop a, a friendship with Chris uh, all, all these years. Um, the other thing that I would just, I would just say about Chris is that um, he has continued, I think, to uh, push forward um, his ideas of leadership. So it wasn't just a one-time book, but he's continued to probe and explore uh, the implications of leadership and what that looks like moving forward. So I'm always uh, paying attention to anything that Chris writes uh, or talks about with regard to my own leadership. So Chris, with that, uh, welcome. Uh, again, you will, of course, deny a lot of this, but thank you for the impact you've had on the LF Global Network. Uh, Dave, thanks a lot. Um, I can still see you in my screen. So why don't you give a thumbs up if the sound is okay? Just so I know. Okay, great. Um, 
So, uh, so thanks for the chance to speak to you guys. I mean, for me, it's, it's a real pleasure because uh, I'm a fan of what you do. I'm a big believer in leadership foundations. I've known Dave for years. Um, and, you know, as I think about the, our life together in the last uh, year or so under this pandemic, there's, I, I don't know how you all feel about what you're doing, but there's a part of me that imagines, man, I mean, these guys must think that what they're doing uh, was never more important and needed. And maybe they're also thinking, man, what we're doing was never more difficult. I don't know, I may be wrong, but that, that would be my, my guesses. Um, thanks for the kind intro stuff. Um, I'll, I'll just say this about it, that uh, uh, Cornelius used this uh, basketball imagery, you know, the coach is sending us out and onto the playing, uh, onto the court. And if that's true, then I'm sure a lot of you uh, watched Hoosiers and maybe you vaguely remember like toward the end this little guy who's not very good has to make two free throws at the end of the game and he's sweating bullets so if if this is all a basketball image then I feel like the little guy at the free throw line I guess um, so um, I was uh, as you heard in the introduction I was a Jesuit uh, seminarian for a number of years and when I discerned understood that that was not my calling in life, I did the next logical thing that anybody would do after leaving a seminary, go to work in an investment bank. Um, and that's, that's all a, a longer story than you probably want to hear or have time for. But at least this bit of it would be relevant that, you know, of course, when you work in a big organization, a big company, you know, you get, you get ingrained to thinking about human organizations in a different kind of a way than people in a seminary would think about it. So I used to think about, think back on my Jesuit experience in a very different lens than priests or seminarians or religious people would. In other words, I would sometimes think, oh, you know, what about, why, would it, why have they been successful? What is the organizational dynamics? What's the corporate culture? These kinds of questions. So that, uh, that was the road I went down when I decided after leaving JP Morgan that I was gonna write something. And you know, the arcane details of what's a Jesuit like, what's a Jesuit different from a Dominican Franciscan, all that stuff, that's totally irrelevant for our conversation today. But I do think there is something that by analogy is deeply relevant and important for you guys. When I say you guys, I'm thinking leadership foundations and friends and so on. Huh? I, I think there is something that's deeply relevant. And that is that in a way, these guys in the 16th century had to solve a problem or a couple of problems that you all have to solve in your own work all the time. And let me frame it in terms of two questions, for example. One, how can I be in the world, but not of the world? Two, how can I live a whole life and not a split life? And let me elaborate on a couple of those questions and, and then I'm gonna uh, move on and, and talk about three ideas that might be helpful to you. So, um, you know, when the Jesuits got started, most religious orders are what we today would call monastic, you know, monasteries, monks. Everybody's seen these pictures of like these guys who live in a completely enclosed, walled off little town and they kind of never leave it, you know, they, some of them, you know, and they pray together multiple times each day. They're going to the chapel five, six times a day. They go a little to do a little work um, in between, but, you know, most of their life revolves around praying and so on. And when the Jesuits got started, in a way they were trying to smash down the walls of these kinds of structures, metaphorically, and really be enmeshed in the world, in cities, frankly. Um, and so they have this problem of, gee, how do you be a, how do you be religious people? How do you be uh, devoted, dedicated, and so on, yet also, 
be in the world. In other words, care about, man, I need to get good results here. We need to have good practices. We want good outcomes. We want to be effective, all those kinds of things. And doing that well, as I'm sure you've all discovered, is not very easy to do, you know, because there's risks like, oh man, uh, I'm really great at um, effective management and so on, but I'm getting so swept up in all this that I've now, I'm now totally in the world. I've kind of half forgotten why I'm doing this in the first place, or my spiritual life has uh, has kind of fallen away in the uh, you know the pressure and so on of of being in the world and being effective in the world. So one of the problems they have to solve, which I suspect you can tell me if I'm wrong, is one you also have is how do we pull that trick off? How do we be effective in the world? but not totally of the world, so to speak. And then the second question related to it, how can I live a whole life and not a split life? And let me use this kind of example to get at what I'm talking about. So, you know, I think it's most relevant for a lot of us who work in corporate organizations or the corporate world and so on. And you meet people a lot of times that you know, they may be believers or deeply committed to whatever their tradition is. They go to a uh, mosque on Friday, temple on Saturday, church on Sunday, whatever their tradition is. And that's very satisfying to them, very fulfilling to them. It's important to them. But then they start going back to work on Monday and they feel like they have to be a different person. And they are a different person. You know, they start to live by different kinds of values because they feel, oh man, you know, in order to be successful, I have to do different things, be a different way and so on. And so essentially they end up leading split lives, you know, like there's like church on Sunday, work on Monday, and those are two different beings, two different people. And, you know, at the end of the day, one that doesn't honor our beliefs if we live that way, but two, it ends up being you know, that kind of schizophrenia ends up frustrating anybody to, into depression or anger or whatever, you know, I mean, we can't kind of live like that ultimately. So these guys kind of have to solve these problems, those kind of problems, you know, how do you pull off being worldly people in the world, people without being worldly and so on. And um, I want to talk about, let me have a quick look at my watch here. Yeah, let me quickly talk about three, what I might call spiritual technologies, you know, three of their, or to use a modern language, three of their hacks, you know, three of the things they do to kind of square that circle, enable them to pull off, to answer these questions I opened up with. And when I say spiritual technologies, people sometimes think I'm cute, but I, I'm very serious about it. You know, the, the Greek word technology, of course, is know-how. Technos is, you know, uh, logos is knowing, technos is how to do, and we all tend to think of technology as, oh yeah, you know, this is technology, uh, and the app is technology, and so on. And I think we don't give credit to the fact that whether it's the Jesuits or leadership foundations, we have some technologies also. You know, there may, be sp there may be spiritual technologies, there may be wisdom technologies, but we have kind of ways of doing things, you know, and I think we have to tap our own wisdom sometimes. Uh, so anyway, so I'm gonna talk about very briefly three uh, spiritual technologies, three hacks to help us be whole people, not split people, to help be, us be in the world, but not of it. I'm gonna talk about unloading your baggage. I'm gonna talk about, uh, you gotta unload your baggage. Two, I'm gonna talk about taking a mental pit stop. And three, I'm gonna talk about loving those you lead. And I probably won't do full justice to any of those ideas in the interest of uh, respecting time, but we can come back to them insofar as you want. So one idea, um, unload your baggage you know um we're living in a world the military has a great acronym i often use uh and i think one of my great colleagues uh and friends with a military background is is on our call maybe more than one um 
uh, the military now sometimes talk about, we're living in an environment that's VUCA. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. And man, those are terribly difficult environments in which to operate, to make decisions and so on. Uh, and of course, if the world around us is really volatile, changing, we also have to be able to change. Not everything, I'm gonna talk about that, but we also have to be able to adapt to change if we're possibly going to make it. And I suspect, you know, the pandemic has been a remarkable lesson to us in openness to change. I would bet a lot of money that a lot of you may have been talking about whether we should do this kind of a thing or that kind of a thing for years. You know, could we use this technology? Could we do that? You know, and no, uh, you know, it's not yet ready. To, it's not the right time. I don't know if we should do that. Then the pandemic comes, boom. Changes that we might have talking about for three years, we did in two weeks. I'm in a hospital system and absolutely with virtual health, telehealth, long, long, long discussed. Uh, not a lot happened and boom, all of a sudden, let's do it. And so the question I put on the table is, you know, we all innovated when we felt there was no other choice. And I think the trick for us is how do we become teams, groups, individuals who are able to innovate when there is a choice? <laughs> In other words, when our backs are not to the wall. And uh, the, the Jesuit uh, tradition has this idea that I will oversimplify and use my own words to describe, you know, where we need to be, first of all, we need to have a clear sense of mission which Leadership Foundation certainly does. If you don't have that, you're lost anyway. It's all a waste of time. So, you know, I have to have a clear sense of, man, why am I here? What am I trying to do? So I, I know what I'm, I know what I want to be for. And then here's the hack, here's the technology. I need to be able to scrutinize myself and understand what inner baggage I got to unload that habitually holds me back from being free enough to pursue the mission fully. So that's, that's the idea, that's the insight. And so, and each of us, you know, I mean, let's be frank, like we all look good in public, but we're all dragging along. If, if all our baggage was on display, we'd be dragging suitcases in here for months, you know, each of us. And we each have our, things, you know, like, oh man, I'm afraid of making a mistake. I'm afraid I might get it wrong. Uh, those kinds of fears, if those, if that baggage predominates, you'll never make any decision because all, we never know that it's going to work for sure, you know, or I'm, hu I'm hung up. It, my baggage involves my own status or my own need to be in control. You know, I don't want to delegate to somebody or I don't want to go along with his or her idea because it didn't come from me, or I don't wanna reduce the spotlight that's on me if we go down this direction. Um, uh, my own need uh, to wanna be in power, to be in control, uh, to be the last say, the person who says, this is the way we do it. Uh, greed, lie, you know, all those kinds of things. So, you know, we all have this kind of crap uh, inside us to use a technical term and often it's what's getting in the way of us being able to innovate or to make good choices on behalf of the mission that's the, that's the first big idea here that i think is relevant and hopefully helpful and you know a few of you may know uh, there was a management book many years ago a built to last i won't go into it but it has one nice mantra that I think is, is relevant here to this first idea. Uh, preserve the core, stimulate progress. So when I say we need to be free, we need to be able to put everything on the table in order to pursue the mission, I hope there are people out there listening saying, well, wait a minute, what is this knucklehead saying that like we might, uh, we might take a poll and give up our belief in the Trinity because 
you know, we should be willing to change everything. I mean, of course, there's much that's part of the core that we're never going to put on the table in terms of our beliefs, our tradition, our culture, our values, how people should be treated, what, you know, all those kind of things. But the trick is, can we understand those things and be able to be open about the rest of those things? And what tends to happen with human beings is that over the years, sometimes precisely because we're successful, everything becomes core. All this ridiculous junk about how we have a meeting or how we do things or who talks first or all this stuff all of a sudden becomes inviolable when in fact, why, would, why, why are we fighting about whether we can't change this? Of course we could change that. So that's the first idea, unload your baggage, be free enough to be able to do the things needed, make the changes needed to serve the mission. Uh, I'm kind of using a lot of time, so I'll talk about the second two ideas more briefly, they're easier ideas to grasp anyway. Second idea, take your mental pit stops. The idea is mental pit stops drawn from IndyCar race. What happens to some clown who feels he or she is gonna race for 500 miles without ever coming in for a pit stop? No way, never gonna work. Uh, and the hack, the spiritual technology is think of one or two times every day, maybe the end of, right after lunch, then at the end of the workday, when I could take two, three, five minutes, during those two, three, five minutes, no phone call, no social media, no text, no songs, no none of that stuff. Just me, or if you will, me and my creator, in those two or three minutes, do three little things, one, Remind yourself, why am I grateful as a person? As spiritual people, we're supposed to be grateful. It's right in our scriptures, but we live our whole lives. If we're effective, we often live our whole lives to do this problems this way. We don't take time to be grateful. So be grateful. Second step, lift my horizon. My horizon tends to be like this, three inches in front of my face. This is what I need to, need to do next. This is the email. This is what I have to call. Instead, during this little break, big, big horizon. Why am I here on earth? What's important anyway? Why am I involved with leadership foundations? You know, some big question that takes me back to root purpose. Third step, all in these couple of minutes, go back through the last few hours. Meetings I was in, problems I dealt with, uh, and maybe revisit them. How did I treat people? What was I thinking? What was going on? Take some little lesson that might help in the next few hours. If I was distracted all morning, what was going on inside me? Can I process that? If I treated somebody in a way I'm not proud of, can I be a big enough person right after this break to send them a note and say, look, I'm sorry, that, that not who I was or what? And here's my, my point, the reason behind, if the reason is not apparent, let me come back to the reason to take us again to VUCA. You know, I think the genius of this little idea is, uh, is obvious when we think about the world we're all living in. We're kind of floating on this river every day of email, phone call, text, distraction, uh, social media, all this stuff. And we find that we're like 100% present all day to every random, crazy, idiotic, miscellaneous distraction that crosses our radar. We're basically in the world fully, and we've become of the world. The only thing we're no longer present to is ultimately what's most important, what's going on inside me in some deep way, what's my relationship with my creator, how is that, that going, huh? So second idea, take your mental pit stop every day. Third idea, very quickly, love those you lead. Deeply Christian virtue, we all agree with that. But in terms of split life, it often feels like, oh man, you know, love, yeah, sure, family, but prayer group, I mean, that has nothing to do like in the real world with business or with operations. I mean, that's not a place for love. So what place could love possibly have in these 
hard scrabble, difficult environments in which we're all faced to work. And let me leave you, leave you with just two little quotes that I hope might, hope might get us at uh, what it could look like to be loving people in difficult environments. First, um, you know, you guys are from different cities. I know Sam is from Boston. Let me remind some of you, there's also a football team in Pittsburgh, I'm sorry. And they do very, very well many years. Might be tough luck for you guys to hear it, but anyway, Pittsburgh is a good team. And once I read an interview with uh, Mike Tomlin and he said this quote, which I think is a way we could imagine loving those you lead. He says, every day when I go to work, I think about the things I could do to make my team successful. So I have a servant's mentality in terms of how I do my job. Perfect. Uh, and, and that's love. The, the, ancient, the ancient and medieval philosophers, you know, one of Aristotle's idea of love, the definition of love is to will to want, to wish the good of another. So there's Tomlin driving to work every day. I want what's good for these people. I want to make them better. I want to make them successful. That's love. That's whole life connecting my beliefs to how I operate all day. One other quote, and then I'll shut up. Uh, Cheryl Stan, Stanberg, uh, chief operating officer of Facebook. Uh, she once says this, leadership, is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that absent, that impact lasts in your absence. I wish I said it, you know, great, great idea, love, wishing the good for another, making others better. And wow, I mean, if as a legacy, you know, think of yourselves, those of you who are presidents or of leadership foundations groups or in any groups, think of those two quotes. If you could get a pile of people coming to work every day thinking, how am I going to make this community successful? How am I going to make these teams successful? How am I going to make my people successful? You're going to have a great team. Or if as leadership foundations, whatever, you all look back 20 years from now at your life and say, this is our legacy. We made people better as a result of our presence. And that impact lasted in our absence. Nice quotes. I wish I made them up myself, you know. Uh, last idea, then I shut up. Uh, you know, you guys also have a lot of wisdom. And, you know, I tried to unpack some of the wisdom in the Jesuit tradition. Might be fun for you guys to sit around. You know, Dave used the idea of charism. Uh, but, you know, in more everyday terms, Dave sometimes used these fancy words. I don't like these fancy words, you know. Like, we have, like, a culture. We have ways we do things. We have know-how. What are some of the things we've learned? You know, what's some of the, our spiritual technology, our hacks, our wisdom uh, about how to do things well? Sorry, I probably, Jonathan Hayden is probably having a kitten there because that was more than 15 minutes, I guess. But tough luck. You know, you turn on the mic with people and you can't control them. Um, so I'll stop now and welcome next Chris. Day, hey, Dave, before you say something, hey, Chris, yeah. in my tradition, there are so many times, a good thing I have my mic off. Mmm, hallelujah. Mmm, praise him. No, he didn't. Shut up. Speak. Say that. Man, there were so many responses I had in my head that all of my responses are an affirmation, I think, of what the Holy Spirit is just saying. And I, uh, Dave, I, you know, I'll let you say what you're going to say. But, hey, Chris, right on, bro. Yeah. It. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. Those two, those two questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna chew on those, man. I'm gonna sit on those. The end, not of, and the whole, not split. That's dope, bro. I don't, and I have no answer today, but at least I know what I'm. Dave always says to me, "Hey, man, it's not about the answer. It really is about making sure you're asking the right questions." And so those are two good questions to chew on. All right, Dave, I'm done. Well, I mean, I think with that, Chris, um, this was ample evidence of just um, the great resource you are. So thank you. Um, I wanted to say to everybody that we actually have the privilege of engaging Chris um, on the LFLC uh, call right after this call. Uh, so for those of you that are interested in having more conversation with Chris, he has generously 
um, given more of his time. So we'll take a quick couple minute break. Jonathan can say something about that, uh, but you all would be welcome uh, if you would like. Um, Chris, I think uh, we've got a lot of questions bubbling up there. Uh, we are up against our time. I think the one thing that I would maybe ask you to comment on real quickly um, would be that, you know, you, you know, here you had this successful business career. Um, you had, you know, done your, your Jesuit thing for a while. In effect, two roads diverged in the wood. Um, and when you thought about writing about an organization, uh, I, you know, I think curiously you chose the Jesuits rather than J.P. Morgan, which is one of the top, you know, companies in the world. What was, what was your instinct there by which to do that? Because I think that is counterintuitive. Okay, um, so uh, Dave, I'll, I'll answer that question directly, but before I do, you know, when you say we're gonna have more questions than time, um, let me say this, and believe me, I'm not selling anything. Um, I'm very happy to kind of keep open a dialogue with folks. I'm very easy to find, chrislowney at gmail.com, uh, Chris on Facebook, Chris Lowney author, you'll find me. Uh, LinkedIn, on Twitter, at Chris Lowney. I, I write pretty regularly for Forbes and Alatea. So, you know, you could connect with me on any of those media or, you know, just send, just send, I gave you my email address, send a question if you want to continue the conversation or, you know, go to a website and so on. So very happy to right. keep Thank the you. conversation alive. And if, and if folks want to give an email address for me to ping you when I put things in Forbes or Alatea, I'd be very happy. Now to come to your question, Dave. So why did I write a book about the Jesuits? So I guess different answer to that question. Um, one cheaper way to figure out my own life than going into therapy, you know. Um, <laughs> but I mean, let me, I guess, I guess I'd say this, you know, maybe I'd answer it two ways. One, people write those kind of books about JP Mor the JP Morgans of the world all the time. You know, nobody needs Chris Lowney to write another book about GE and Jack Welch or JP Moore. There's plenty of money and resource invested in that. But, but in terms of thinking about the Jesuits this way, I'm not saying I'm smarter than anyone else, by no means, by no means. But I had a unique perspective and I thought, oh, you know, I mean, I, that might add some value. But now the second thing I would say, Dave, is, um, you know, what's worthwhile doing in life? And I, and I kind of felt part of working in a big organization is, you know, you think about, I don't know what, you know, questions about what, what makes organizations good and worthwhile and what, what's worth doing in life and how ought we to live and all those kind of questions. And it, seems, it seemed to me that, you know, writing the thing I did was going to be an opportunity to put some of those question some of those deeper things on the table you know and invite people to think about you know who do i want to be what's worth living at and so on. now let me say a third thing that i think is also really important and relevant so my idea was not to get it out of my system but i thought oh you know i'll write this thing it'll be fun you know like i worked for the man for 17 years you know i'm like every day going to work doing all this thing and now I could be my own little guy for a few months and just write this little book and get on with life. And then people started, um, you know, asked me to give talks. I kind of enjoyed writing, so I've written some more. And it's really made me um, humble and reflective about if a non-believer might say coincidence, a believer might say how the mysterious ways that God works in the world a, a quote that's become really important to me. Uh, you guys, uh, some of you uh, remember Soren Kierkegaard, you know, that Danish philosopher, Christian. Uh, and one of his lines is, um, life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. In other words, like we're kind of going this way through life and it looks like this crazy zigzag, is this ever gonna work? What the heck am I doing uh, thing? But then when you look back over the last 15, 20 years, sometimes you say, holy cow, man. I mean, there's some 
how each thing led to the next or the patterns and so on, I never would have imagined that. And I guess I mentioned that not to talk about my life, but to talk about your guy's life in a way, because I think, I suspect a lot of what you're doing in terms of the, um, the sort of building community, outreach, mixing with others, partnerships, maybe has the sa sometimes the same haphazard, crazy, how's this all gonna work? Is it all moving in a straight line? It seems to be going like that. But then sometimes you look back and say, wow, that's really interesting what came out of that, you know? That's um, excellent. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chris. Well, again, thank you. And everybody, um, you are welcome to our, our kind of second hour with uh, Chris here in uh, the next few minutes. With that, though, um, let me uh, get to uh, Sam Acevedo. Um, Sam runs the Leadership Foundation in, uh, in Boston. Um, I, one of the things I say all the time to people um, when they ask, well, how have you stayed around so long? Uh, you know, the quick answer in Leadership Foundations is it's because of the colleagues, uh, the brothers, the sisters that you get a chance to work with. Uh, Sam is one of those people um, who has uh, been in countless ways and in countless times a part of the ballast that has kept me afloat and kept me moving forward. So it is a, it's great pleasure to introduce Sam, who uh, heads up the Higher Education Resource Center, uh, HERC. Uh, in Boston and is the Leadership Foundation president in Boston. So, Sam, with that, thank you. And uh, let's just begin um, to talk a little bit about Boston itself. Um, what is it about Boston that now has captured your heart and mind all these years? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Dave, uh, love back at you. Um, and um, there is a strange, you know, affinity and brethrenship between this Pentecostal Puerto Rican and um, this uh, um, uh, maven of monasteries and great just with thinking. Uh, so we could both love Chris Lowry today. Um, and I want to just pick up on that. One of the things that I love, it could, it could, be, it could be one of the most intimidating things about running an LF in a town like Boston but it's actually the thing that is the most invigorating, effervescent, and rewarding. You said that, um, that uh, in your remarks that LF isn't trying to do something new, uh, to uh, do something untethered by what's been done before. Uh, and there, there's just some wonderful organizations already in this city doing great work across the city, the Emmanuel Gospel Center the Black Ministerial Alliance um, and other entities uh, uh, that have percolated uh, before and since then, the Boston Collaborative. But as you've know, as as you shared and as Chris shared in his remarks, leadership is about making others better. Or um, as, as we, you know, we've, uh, we've stated in our, in our own three functions, we, we wanna engage leaders of good faith and goodwill. We want to equip those who have a heart for this city, encourage them is another way to put it, and develop joint initiatives together. And nothing can serve as a better catalyst to do all of those things than a shared catastrophe. And this last year, one way to look at this pandemic is the awful and the awfulness that it actually is right and and you know 500,000 Americans have died and you know it, it has served as a as a catalyst to up upend our thinking about right, racial equity the other way to look at it is is it has served as a catalyst for the city to come together and be the best of itself and uh, I've had a privilege to be a part of this city in this year. Um, uh, and I, you know, so when schools closed on, um, uh, we're coming up to the anniversary now. Uh, it was St. Patrick's Day in Boston. St. Patrick's Day, 2020 was the last day that students uh, uh, 
uh, were, a, were welcomed in school buildings and all of these other, uh, all of these other businesses were, you know, moved freely. And um, that day, you know, uh, demonstrated, you know, th those cl cl closures uh, exposed two very vulnerable populations that the Boston Higher Education Resource Center and the Comunicación de Honduras, in connection with all of these beautiful city organizations, serve most closely uh, in, in direct service. We, um, we have a ministry to first-generation students of color in the city. Um, and before that day, we were serving 800 of them inside uh, a network of nine Boston public schools. What do you do when you, when you can no longer send coaches inside a BPS classroom? And also, uh, we, had a, we have a ministry to the homeless that we share with um, a, a network of five uh, churches in the city and the Emmanuel Gospel Center. Well, what do we do when you can no longer break bread at a table? So uh, on St. Patrick's Day, 2020, um, we were one of the first organizations in the city uh, to, uh, um, uh, to roll out a remote learning platform. Uh, at, very, at, the, at the very first, it, it wasn't pretty. Uh, you know, it wasn't an F-15, it was the Wright Brothers plane. We just were, we were uh, determined to um, stay connected with our network of students via every means possible texting and Zooming and so on. And, um, and uh, uh, what blossomed from that, uh, just being mindful of time, was um, just this one of the most liberating education experiences that we've seen in Boston for a long time, uh, a campus without walls. And indeed, the Boston Higher Education Resource Center, along with seven other nonprofits in the city, is now piloting a uh, program that allows students, you know, to just, who are trapped into these schools that limit them. Um, now online, you know, if you're, you're under, uh, uh, under resource school in Mattapan or in Dorchester or JP, doesn't have, you know, that AP cl uh, um, calculus course, uh, you you could get online. It's like a master class for high school students. But um, beyond that, we've seen some really wonderful heroic things happening. Um, I'm part of uh, the city's health inequities task force, which has you know um, has addressed this pandemic uh, specifically in uh, communities and its impact in our communities of color. And like uh, Chris said, this has been a season to uh, make, introduce some changes that we always knew needed to happen. And just we just couldn't get around to it until we had a good old fashioned catastrophe. For years, people have been writing, ab writing about the digital divide among our students. And uh, when COVID hit, a good, you know, 60% uh, of our kids did not have their own laptops. Overnight, it forced Boston Public Schools to send these um, Chromebooks to 50,000 kids in PPS. Amen. But then what do you do with it? Amen. Then what do you do with it? Um, so we, uh, you know, we, we discovered that this was the time to... Um, introduce equity into things like uh, access to our exam schools and their um, admissions policies and so on. Uh, so Boston has become a much more loving and equitable place. Um, and I think the Church of Jesus Christ uh, has done the Lord proud in this season. Amen. Well, Sam, hey, if there was a, again, we're just pressed up against time, but yes, sir. What, what I love is the, uh, <laughs> Y'all, this is a great example of what Chris was saying, the end not of, the whole not split. And so, man, I, hey, and Joel dropped you um, a shout out in the chat, Sam, and just thank you for the work that you've done and inviting him into the 
space that it would lead to him being the president of our leadership foundation. So I just want to, on behalf of our team, say thank you, man. Keep up the good work. I'd love to have some more time, you know, I mean, get with no, you. No, that's so. good. Yeah. So, hey, hey, John, John, you have a couple of reminders and then we'll uh, move forward so we can get to come on. Yeah, just very quickly, I, I uh, we will chat out links to uh, Streetlights where you can watch any of the recordings, um, including today's. I know there was so much rich material. Uh, it would be great to go back um, and see it again, uh, as well as uh, the newest podcast episode. A reminder, the uh, Leadership Foundation's Leadership Council reception will be immediately following the town hall in just a few minutes. Uh, Noah has the Zoom set up over there. And we're going to show a quick, we've got a great project that uh, Corn's going to talk about called Compound Impact uh, that is just launching. So while I get that video pulled up, it's just 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, Corn can introduce that. Man, you got it, Jonathan. Hey, you know, again, last, last year, you know, Dave talks about the three things that's unleashed um, during this pandemic, and one of them was the social unrest. And so uh, what I love is that leadership foundations, local leadership foundations are really trying to address the inequity uh, in different places. And so our uh, local leadership foundation in Grand Rapids has really kind of taken the lead, amen, the Center for Community Transformation in trying to champion this idea that we're calling compound interest, compound um, interest, yeah, impact. Is it compound impact? Okay. But we have a video that we want to show of the great work that they're doing as we kind of engage in a partnership with um, the Kellogg Foundation. So Jonathan, go ahead, hit it up, buddy. And then after that, Reverend Jean will close us out in prayer. Within communities of color resides remarkable talent and untapped capacity. 40% of college educated black professionals are underemployed. But we believe that within those communities are emerging leaders who dream to provide not only for their families, but who also deeply care for society's injustices. But it's not just about talent. It's about concerted development, networks, and connections. Now, imagine it's 2030. People of color are beginning to gain equal access to corporate leadership positions as businesses realize the full promise of diverse communities. As a result, these professionals are building wealth, owning homes, opening businesses, mentoring others, and becoming community and civic leaders in neighborhoods where they grew up. By 2030, we would have worked alongside thousands of leaders of color, placed them in positions of serious influence. They will be creating wealth, owning homes, highly networked, but also committed and connected to their communities. Here we stand with the opportunity to realize this vision, one shared by Leadership Foundation's global network of deeply embedded community organizations. To leverage corporate job placements and align them with existing community and economic development efforts. We call it Compound Impact. Will you join us? Join us. What's that? Gene? Start. <laughs> gotcha. There you go. Way to, way. Bill, way to be a good wing. Way to help out, buddy. Thank you. Reverend Jean, can you close us in prayer, please? I invite you to pray with me. Creator God, we give you thanks for this Leadership Foundation community working around the world to bridge divides of many kinds. You have created an ordered universe that is constantly changing and intended to support new life. And you have given us guidelines to follow in our relationships for us to thrive. We regularly experience both chaos disorder and disease all around us. And even in our inner landscape, our relationships and our global community. We ask for your forgiveness when we have fallen short. At the same time, the seeds of new life 
are being planted everywhere. Healing is happening in our lives and in our communities. Give us compassion, we pray, for ourselves and for others when we choose to depart from the way of love. Help us to be people who are truth tellers and support the way of love and engage with creative imagination to join with those of good faith and goodwill to continue to build healthy communities. In the name of the one God, amen. 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 Hey, everyone, I just want to, again, remind you of the conversation that's going on with Chris in the um, LFLC following this. Um, I asked Jonathan before he shuts us down to just give us about 30 seconds. The link is in the chat. So if you want to thank, thank you very much, Carrie, for dropping that in. Hey, just really want to give you an opportunity. Hey, click on the chat right now before we shut this down. Um, and it's almost for those of us that come out of a Young Life tradition. I feel like this is cabin time. We're getting cabin time with Chris. This is great. And so uh, click on the chat, man. It's been great being with you, Sam. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Reverend Gene. Thank you, Dave. Dope job. Jonathan, Carey, man, way to finish strong today. So, hey, blessings to everyone. And let's uh, continue to move forward and changing cities from battlegrounds to playgrounds. Huh? I should read it. Yeah. I